it's Australia's great natural wonder. But the Barrier Reef is under pressure. Do you think Australians in general have a real idea of how much trouble the Barrier Reef is in? No, I don't believe the wider Australian population is aware of the concerns. So why has the government approved dumping in the marine park which just presents further danger? That decision has to be a political decision. The unequivocal advice that uh, we received was this can be done safely. How much do we really care about our most iconic national treasure? Welcome to Four Corners. As a child, one of the first memorable things I learned about Australia's geography was that we could boast of having one of the seven great natural wonders of the world. Not only could we be proud of having the most extensive and most spectacular reefs, but it was also a great little earner. Perhaps the fact that it had been created without any pain or effort to the nation made it easier for us to take it for granted. But the bottom line is that for nearly half a century as a journalist, I've been reporting, reading, watching and now presenting stories on its decline. First, it was the crown of thorn starfish and our rather tepid response to the risk. But bar cyclones, every threat ever since has come from human hand. Now, just last week, another major report to government with another dire warning that the Barrier Reef is in poor condition, has worsened since the last review five years ago and is expected to decline further. Yet the same authority that released the latest alarming report on the reef, the authority that's charged with protecting the reef, has at the same time approved the dumping of dredged waste near the reef. Despite big problems the last time that happened, and even its own scientists are up in arms. Marion Wilkinson's report includes disturbing new revelations. Once a year, after a full moon, the Great Barrier Reef puts on nature's most spectacular orgy. The mass spawning of millions of corals. The vital renewal of the world's largest reef system. amounts of the spawn goes absolutely everywhere and then the ocean surface turns pink. It's amazing. Nothing like it in any part of the world really. But marine scientist Dr Charlie Berrin is increasingly seeing the coral's fantastic life cycle under threat. Well the coral spawning is drastically reduced if something is wrong with the water quality. Varen is Australia's godfather of coral reefs. His epic Corals of the World is still a bible for marine scientists. I have described and catalogued all the corals of the world, mapped them, photographed them. But these days, the retired chief scientist for the Australian Institute of Marine Science is also documenting the collapse of the Great Barrier Reef. Well, the inshore Great Barrier Reef has changed beyond recognition in my time. So I would go to places now that used to be flourishing corals and are now just pretty much dead. Um, that's the inshore Great Bay, but it's been really badly damaged. Dr Verin, like many Australian marine scientists, believes the Great Barrier Reef is under severe stress. So he was alarmed by the government's decision to allow the mass dumping of dredge spoil in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park to build a bigger coal port. That decision has to be a political decision. It is not supported by science at all. Um, and I was absolutely flabbergasted when I, when I heard of that decision. To dump it in the middle of the marine park, adding further stress to the environment of the Great Barrier Reef, is utterly reprehensible.
Last month, the Federal Environment Minister signed the final approval for the largest coal project in Australia's history. Coal from the planned Carmichael mine in Queensland's Galilee Basin will be shipped through the port of Abbott Point inshore from the Great Barrier Reef. The coal project is controlled by Indian billionaire Gautam Adani. A second Indian billionaire, GVK Reddy, also has a huge mine planned in the Galilee with Gina Reinhardt, and so does Clive Palmer. These are some of the biggest mines we'll ever see in, in Australia. We, we don't have uh, coal projects of this order, and they are being designed at a scale uh, that, again, that will deliver very good cost structures. To export all this coal, the port at Abbott Point wants to triple in size. That's why the federal government has allowed the dredging of three million cubic metres from the seabed here, which will be dumped in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. I did a very careful and deep review. And what was clear is that uh, we could tighten and strengthen the conditions, confine what was being done to one 180,000th of the area of the marine park, an area the size of Italy, and take clean sand-based material a short distance to other clean sand-based material. And so the unequivocal advice that uh, we received was this can be done safely. It will have impacts on the Great Barrier Reef basically, on seagrass, on dugong, on turtles and possibly even on coral reefs and other things. How much impacts? Hard to say, true, but dumping three million cubic metres, five million tonnes of sediment, even well offshore in deep water, will have impacts. The proposed dump site off Abbott Point is just four kilometres from the nearest coral reef and it's only three kilometres from the site of an historic Catalina plane wreck from World War II. The remains of the victims were never recovered. The community outrage was so great, the port developer is now looking for an alternative site. I mean, it is quite extraordinary. Approval has been given to one particular site that even the proponent admits is unacceptable. Um, yet there's no clear uh, alternate site um, for, for where that dump spoil should be, uh, should be dumped. The dumping approval has made Abbott Point ground zero in the battle over the future of the Great Barrier Reef. It's been criticised by UNESCO, by environmentalists and by scientists inside and outside the government. My reaction was disappointment because the scientific evidence is, is very clear. Um, dumping dredge spoil is, is a dangerous thing to do to the marine park. The marine park is in declining condition and the last thing it needs is yet another stressor. I believe there are alternatives that weren't properly considered when that decision was made. If we did a proper evaluation of all the alternatives, that decision would not have been made. In the end, they wanted the cheapest, quickest, dirtiest option at Abbott Point, and that's what they got. What stunned many scientists is that the guardian of the reef, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, approved the dumping of the dredge spoil despite the concerns of its own experts. Its decision is now being challenged in court and its chairman, Russell Reichelt, is under attack. I regard Russell as a good friend, and he's always had a very sharp eye for science, and so I am completely mystified by that decision. I would be most interested to see how it came about because it is certainly not based on science, and I wonder about the independence of the Marine Park Authority. I don't know the politics of it, but there must have been something going on because it's completely out of kilter with Russ's normal way of operating. 
I would agree with the concerns of the scientists. I, I disagree with their conclusion that Abbott Point will harm the Great Barrier Reef. The risks around Abbott are low and approvals were given on that basis. They, they are manageable. But a lot of your scientists in your authority disagreed with you, didn't they? No. The sci the, what the scientists did was spend nearly a year helping me and colleagues understand the risks that could occur if they weren't mitigated. But tonight, a former senior director with the Marine Park Authority speaks out publicly for the first time against the Abbott Point dumping. It's flagged to become the biggest coal port in the country, if not in the world. John Day resigned from the authority last month after two decades of dedicated service. Should we be dumping spoil in the Marine Park? I don't believe we should. Um, it's having adverse impacts. We've seen that elsewhere. And there are alternatives. Sure, they may cost more, but again, we're dealing with a World Heritage Area, the most important World Heritage Area on the planet, uh, a magnificent marine protected area that the wo world wants us to protect. Our own legislative mandate says the long-term protection and conservation of the values, and we're not doing that. Four Corners can reveal the Abbott Point decision was bitterly fought inside the Marine Park Authority right up until January this year. For months, the Authority's key experts in Townsville advised their superiors and the Federal Environment Department that the dumping was unacceptable. Well, I certainly think the advice was well based. I know the people who are involved in developing it. Uh, and they're, they're experts in their, in their field, so I know the advice was very well based. The advice of the Marine Park Authority experts is contained here in hundreds of internal documents. Released under Freedom of Information to environmentalists, they include candid emails revealed tonight for the first time. In June 2013, the Authority's Director of Environmental Assessment, Adam Smith, drew up advice for a draft recommendation for the Authority to reject the Abbott Point dumping plan. It stated bluntly... The likely impact of the dredging and disposal in the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area currently proposed would be environmentally and socially unacceptable. I encourage those staff to air those views and the, ch the project changed considerably over the life to, to something that at the end a decision was made, taking all of that into account, that that disposal could occur safely. It would be legally but internal documents reveal the authority only made the decision to approve the dumping after Reichelt put a new manager over the experts who had originally advised against it. That manager, Bruce Elliott, was questioned last month at a Senate hearing about his expertise in marine science. What are your qualifications? Um, I don't have a background in marine science at all. Uh, my background is uh, primarily in working for the federal government for uh, pretty much all of my career. Uh, Defence, tax and now the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. Something obviously happened where the expertise, the, you know, the very strong on-ground expertise that was generated from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority in Townsville was, was changed. Soon after Elliot's appointment, he emailed Director Adam Smith, challenging the advice to reject the dumping. The draft proposal recommends a refusal, yet my own assessment is that it should be an approval, potentially with further conditions. But the authority's ports manager, Rianne Gilbert, backed Smith and the recommendation to refuse the dumping, emailing him... Most, if not all, of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority scientists would agree with the refusal recommendation. But Bruce Elliott criticised the refusal recommendation on the dumping, claiming it was skewed by a flawed risk assessment. Gilbert objected. The flawed risk assessment that Bruce refers to has been contributed to by all the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority scientists. Those in the authority against the dumping 
wanted the owners of Abbott Point, North Queensland bulk ports, to look at alternatives. This included extending the length of the loading trestles at the port. This could cost more than 10 times as much as the dumping. It was opposed by the coal industry as unsafe. Essentially, what we've got there is, is a safety issue. Uh, the, the, that's a very exposed uh, situation. Uh, it was a shipping safety issue. It wasn't really a cost issue. But again, environmentally, did you really want to have a long trestle being built out into the marine park? WWF's Richard Leck has scrutinised scores of the authorities' internal warnings on Abbott Point. They show a high risk of impacts on water quality and the local marine environment. But last year, the Gillard government rejected the advice to oppose it. Instead, it put off making a decision. The previous uh, federal Labor government had two opportunities to take that advice from the Marine Park Authority, and they squibbed that decision both times. When Greg Hunt became the new Environment Minister after the election, he approved the dredging and dumping at Abbott Point with what he called the toughest environmental conditions. On advice from his department, he in turn formally advised the authority to approve the dumping. But Hunt insists the Abbott Point approval will be the last dumping of dredge spoil in the marine park. I made the decision that this would be the last time that we were changing the practice. And since then, we have stopped four inherited proposals from proceeding which would have seen material deposited into the marine park, so five down to one. That was actually included in this decision. I remember the very words were, this is a line in the sand. The Marine Park Authority chairman defends the Abbott Point dumping and insists it is low risk because of new conditions they imposed. The approval that you've given is mm risk-free or low risk? We'll do no harm to the barrier reef. Um, the, the, the changes locally for a short time would be noticeable but would not be harming the corals, the dugong, the turtle, the seagrasses. Well, how do you feel then that nearly every leading marine scientist in the country is opposed to this decision? Well, I respect the, my scientific colleagues. Um, the The... Their view of the decision is couched on a very narrow view of the state of the system and this proposal. Um, I would agree with them that overall dredging should come down. At a gathering of coral reef scientists in Canberra last month, the ructions over the Abbott Point decision were on public display. We know now that the management arrangements governments at Abbott Point um, were, how can I put it kindly, less than optimal. <laughs> John Brody was once director of water quality at the Marine Park Authority. He's now a vocal critic of the dumping in the Marine Park. And even then, once it's out there, this extra fine material, it can be resuspended uh, by the wind. Um, if it's in deeper water, by cyclones, regularly and easily, and that will cause sediment plumes that will have impacts on um, things like seagrass and coral that surround the dump site. Abbott Point has brought to the surface a much bigger debate about port dredging and coral reefs. Pristine waters off Lizard Island in far north Queensland, marine scientist Joe Pollock sees the Great Barrier Reef at its best. But Pollock is here studying coral disease. Well, disease in, in any system can be a natural phenomenon. 
So when we're at Lizard Island, we see disease, but we don't see super, super high levels of it. Pollock and his colleagues last month released the first ever study linking coral disease with port dredging. The study wasn't done on the Great Barrier Reef, but in Western Australia, on the coral reefs off Barrow Island, the site of the country's largest single LNG project. Seven million cubic metres of sediments were dredged here for the port in 2011. Essentially what we found is that near the dredge impact sites, we had two times as much coral disease than we had at our, our nearby control sites. And why do you think that happened? Corals are composed of, they're basically part animal and part plant. So the plant part needs light to do photosynthesis and the, the animal part needs food to eat. So when you get dredging, you stir up all this sediment that sediment makes the water cloudy, that's called turbidity, and that reduces the amount of light that's available for the plant part to do photosynthesis. And as that sediment falls out of the water column onto the coral surface, it can clog up its ability to feed. Pollock found the corals were seriously impacted 10 to 20 kilometers away from the dredge site. Many showed symptoms of a deadly disease called White Syndrome. White Syndrome is basically like, you can think of it as if the skin started falling away from your hand, moving down, just leaving behind your bone. That lesion continues to move down your arm until basically all that's left of you is dead white skeleton. So once that disease lesion has moved over that bit of coral, it can never recover. Pollock's research has fed into the fraught debate over Abbott Point because it comes as all sides agree the Great Barrier Reef is under mounting stress. A Marine Park Authority report released last week shows a serious decline over two-thirds of the reef in the last five years. I think the reef is under extreme pressure and I would agree with the bulk of scientific comment about the state of the reef. Coral cover is down, uh, dugongs were, are down and, and um, very low along the probably 1,000 kilometres plus of the coastline affected by the floods. The um, seagrasses is of major concern because that's the food for dugong. Um, it, seagrass also uh, acts to clean up water quality by trapping fine sediment and it's at a significant low point now. In fact, Cairns area, it's as low as ever been recorded. So they're the big things that have changed. Agricultural runoff from Queensland's rivers has been the big cause of the drop in water quality on the inshore reef. Outbreaks of crown of thorn starfish have been linked to the runoff. Recent floods and cyclones have spread out the sediments in the runoff. Most of the reduction in coral cover coincided exactly with the influx of the major storms. With turbid water full of nutrients and algae, you find that the corals aren't able to recruit as easily. So when scientists say there's lost resilience, it means the corals are not growing back as quickly. John Brodie has worked for years with government to clean up agricultural runoff impacting the reef. But he argues big port dredging and dumping in Queensland is undermining those efforts and adding more stress to the reef. The real problem is that while agricultural pollution is being managed to some extent under reef plan, not to the extent that the government claims that it is, but it is being managed to some extent, port pollution and port governance is in disarray. You can clearly see a, a sediment plume uh, change. Until recently, port dredging and dumping inshore from the Great Barrier Reef was regarded as having limited local impacts. But the Director of Coral Reef Studies at Townsville's James Cook University argues dredging is far more damaging to the reef than officially acknowledged. 
We're now starting to see evidence that the dredge spoil goes across the whole breadth of the Great Barrier Reef. A portion of the dredge spoil is very fine sediment, tiny little particles that are suspended in the water column and they're dispersed by winds, by currents and by waves. And over a period of just a few months, they can travel 100 kilometers or more. That evidence is now very clear. There are other ways of getting ships to the coal. And the Professor Hughes is calling for a complete ban on dumping dredge spoil not only in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, but all the waters surrounding the reef. The main uh, danger for corals is sediment runoff from land. So we can try and improve the amount of sediment that's coming out of rivers, and the government is now spending hundreds of millions of dollars doing that, and it is working to a small extent. It's very expensive, and we need to do more of that. But what you don't do to turn that trajectory around is allow millions and millions of tons of dread spoil to be dumped on the Great Barrier Reef. The Queensland and federal governments have released plans to reduce dredging and dumping inshore from the Great Barrier Reef. Both the federal minister and the Marine Park Authority say it's being done. Ports are one of those things. They do need to be managed. Their footprint needs to be contained. We need to implement the port strategy, use master planning to bring down the total amounts of uh, both capital and in the long run maintenance dredging. I believe that's doable. But while the government is now drawing the line in the sand, the Abbott Point dumping, for now, is going ahead. And the backlash over that decision is coming not just from environmentalists and scientists, but from Queensland's powerful tourism industry. For decades, Queensland's coal industry and its tourism industry lived side by side along the Great Barrier Reef. But now the demands of the coal companies and the tourism operators are colliding. And you can see it most clearly here at the gateway to the beautiful with Sunday Islands. <laughs> flock to the Wheat Sundays from around the world. It makes up a big part of the six and a half billion dollar tourism industry on the Great Barrier Reef. <laughs> but the reef here lies offshore from Queensland's two big coal ports, Abbott Point and Hay Point, that saw a huge dredging operation in 2006. We've had um, quite a serious decrease in our water quality here in the Sundays. There's all sorts of evidence showing that. Tony Brown is president of the Sunday Charter Boat Industry Association. He's demanding to know if the Abbott Point dumping will impact his business. Visibility at diving sites here is a big issue. It's dropped dramatically in recent years as sediments in the water have shot up. There's been an alarming jump in sediment. Um, it happened in 2010 and it went from basically 1 or 2% to 23%. Uh, so that's a very big concern. Where did this sediment come from? And this is part of the questions we've been asking for whether there's any relationship with sea dumping or whether it's something else. For many tourists, seeing the reef is still a magical experience. What did you see? <laughs> a lot of fish. <laughs> yeah, and also very big fish, and they come so close to us, and it was amazing, yeah. <laughs> But tour operators know murky waters will affect visitor numbers. And Brown is worried that the dumping of three million cubic metres of spoil off Abbott Point will make visibility worse. Um, look, our industry is disappointed because we felt that they should have made every effort to understand whether there is a true impact to our region because of sea dumping in the past. Um, there has been incredible 
rise in sediment in our area. Let's understand where this is coming from, what is, what is causing it, and then make those kind of decisions. So, of course, it was a disappointing decision from our perspective. The storms and flooding rivers in Queensland over the last five years are largely blamed for the sharp fall in water quality affecting visibility on the reef here. Tony and, and his colleagues are accurately describing the low state of water quality. Um, the issue for me is not just the Whitsundays. That pattern is repeated along the southern two-thirds of the barrier reef. Uh, the signals that we're getting from the AIM satellite analyses is, is that it's primarily driven by rivers. But tourism operators are now questioning whether the huge expansion of the coal port at Hay Point back in 2006 also played some part. There's a lot of information out there showing that we have had a degradation in our water quality. Um, obviously, we don't know whether it's Hay Point. It could be a whole host of other reasons, but we certainly are concerned because it was a massive 8.6 million cubic metre uh, sea disposal. The fraught debate over dredging and dumping inshore from the Great Barrier Reef erupted at Gladstone three years ago. The Ports Corporation here undertook a massive 46 million cubic metre dredge plan for an LNG project. It was an environmental fiasco. You know, Gladstone is ground zero of poor management. And what that, um, what that says to us is that when you approve something like Abbott Point, which the safety net for the approval is a vast array of highly complicated conditions, our faith in those conditions actually being able to deliver is, is taken away because we just look at what happened only a few years ago um, at Gladstone. Most of the dredge spoil was to be contained behind this giant bund wall in Gladstone Harbour. The rest dumped at a site just 400 metres from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. In 2011, the state and federal labour governments insisted tough environmental regulations were in place. We had a task force working with different sections of my own agency, uh, the Marine Division, the Approvals Division and the Marine Park Authority were part of that as well. Yeah. Wait until you have a good look, Ted. Yeah. But Four Corners went to Gladstone that year to investigate the outbreak of a mysterious fish disease in the harbour. And the red fins. The red fins, that's the start of it. This fella here has got the bad red eye bulged out, ready to what we call, we've, we've been calling it exploding. Fish wholesaler Ted Whittingham told us then he believed the fish disease was linked to the dredging. The disease comes from stress. The stress is being caused by the development on the harbour. The stress is being caused from the runoff of acid sulphate soils. The stress is coming from the turbidity in the water. State and federal governments denied any link between the dredging and the fish disease. The port said there was no significant drop in the water quality in the harbour. But this year, the new federal environment minister released a damning report revealing the bund wall design was flawed and it had leaked spoil sediments into the harbour. We're told years down the track that the bund wall was leaking silt at the rate of 4,000 tonnes uh, per day into the harbour continually uh, for over 12 months. The reviewer, Andrew Johnson from CSIRO, uh, made some uh, pretty powerful findings. He said that the conditions were not good enough, the monitoring wasn't good enough, the assessment wasn't good enough, and he was right. 
Ted Whittingham now lives in Brisbane. Both my sons uh, had left town and um, the business had totally collapsed, so uh, there was just too much pain there. He's deeply disappointed the independent inquiry was not allowed to investigate any links to the fish disease, despite a key study showing high levels of heavy metals in local turtles. The, the Gladstone development destroyed a business that I spent 30 years building with my family and my sons, um, and it's been totally destroyed. Um, of course I'm angry, personally. I'm also angry that, from an environmental perspective, um, that the government uh, has, has been charged with um, managing one of the seven wonders of the world and they're quite happy to put this under threat for the sake of uh, very short economical development. We have already reformed the processes quite dramatically and we have taken on board the lessons of a previous age, a previous government, a previous era. Uh, we have uh, not just done that, we have tripled, tripled the total personnel in the monitoring and compliance section of the department. We have put in place toughest, uh, tougher conditions, in fact, the toughest conditions in Australian history. But the systemic failures in Gladstone have left environmental groups deeply skeptical about assurances over Abbott Point. There was a, a systematic massive failure with the Bund Wall that's meant to get toxic and contaminated dredge spoil out of the harbour. Now that does nothing to increase your faith in the ability of governments to implement and, and monitor their own approval conditions. Since the approval of Abbott Point in January, the Queensland Resources Council has been at the forefront of defending the decision. Head Michael Roche argues the objections are driven by green groups opposed to the giant Galilee Basin coal mines that will use the port. It's called Stopping the Australian Coal Export Boom. It was a document prepared and led by Greenpeace, but with the support of a whole range of other uh, NGOs. Uh, it sets out a whole range of strategies around litigation, around creating fear around the Great Barrier Reef, about creating investor uncertainty. In part, he is right. But the industry also knows Coal from the mines will emit vast amounts of greenhouse gases that will impact the reef. Last week's Marine Park Authority report concluded that climate change and ocean acidification caused by greenhouse gas emissions are the most serious long-term threats to the reef. Um, the scientists are disputing how, how it might play out. No one is disputing that it will have a dramatic effect on coral growth. As the oceans are forced to absorb more and more greenhouse gases, scientists predict the reef waters will become more acidic and hostile to marine life, triggering extinctions. And one senior coral scientist is now arguing the Galilee mines should not go ahead. Well, if these new coal mines go ahead, and there's a big question over the whole economics of that, they will um, put out a huge amount of CO2 emissions. That CO2 goes into the ocean. It causes ocean CO acidification. Ocean acidification is a big issue for the future of the Great Barrier Reef. So instead of contributing to CO2 emission by developing these mines, Australia should be leading the charge in transitioning to renewable energy. Well, there's no doubt that the science suggests that over the long term, uh, climate change can be a, a big problem. That's why there's so much work that's going in, a lot of it funded by industry and others, uh, around adaptation. And that's uh, a big focus of the work done by the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. But fundamentally, they're saying that what your members produce will ultimately kill the reef. Is that... Do you think that's what they're saying? Well, Marion, I, I don't accept that Australia should take upon itself 
responsibility for keeping our coal in the ground if uh, it's still going to be demanded by places like China, India and Southeast Asia. If our coal is not supplied, all we do is deny ourselves the jobs, the investment, the tax revenues to fund services, but the coal will be supplied. Whether the huge Galilee coal mines will go ahead is still an open question because the price of coal is falling. But the Environment Minister does not believe the mine should be stopped because their emissions will threaten the reef. Our task now is to ensure that the breakthroughs in technology and the reduction in emissions, which can be done through better technology, occurs. But if you're asking uh, us to stop 100 million people in India having for the first time electrification or having significantly extended electricity, the great goal of bringing humanity out of deep, grinding poverty, we're not a, able to stop that as a country, and B, we shouldn't be condemning people to poverty. You know, that's a bandied about phrase, but the canary in the coal mine. Since his retirement from Australia's Institute of Marine Science, Charlie Barron has no hesitation speaking out about the threat to the reef from greenhouse emissions. It's incredibly serious. What we are doing now is pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at a rate which has never happened remotely before. Now, this will acidify the oceans and that's, that'll be the end of it for corals. It's very, very serious. That won't happen until well on through this century, but it will happen. after the World Heritage Committee listed the Great Barrier Reef as one of the wonders of the natural world, it is officially in poor shape and expected to decline. This year, the committee sharply criticised Australia over the Abbott Point decision. Next year, it will decide whether to put the reef on its in danger list. It would be a travesty if that happened. It would be incredibly damaging to the tourism industry. It would be damaging to Australia's reputation. Well, it was put on the watch list under somebody else's time, but I am absolutely determined that it comes off the watch list under my time. It's uh, impossible to know whether the committee will take that action, but I think um, it's the, the way the committee was reacting this year, uh, they were not happy. And unless, as I said, a lot happens between now and then, then it's entirely possible it could be listed. Well, Corners has learned it is now possible the Abbott Point dumping approval could be reopened before the committee meets next year. Protecting the reef's extraordinary life and beauty has always been a trade-off with human activity. But those who know the reef best say now more than ever we risk losing our most precious natural icon. Scientists, believe it or not, are interested in more than just writing the obituary of the Great Bear Reef. We, we want to be offering solutions for how to turn these bad trajectories downwards. We have a lot of information about the Great Bear Reef. It's probably the best studied coral reef in the world. So it's undeniable that, that it's in trouble. The question is, do we have the political will and the, the will of the public of Australia to turn this around? No one will ever see the coral reefs of the world like I have. Because even if they had the opportunity, they're not there anymore, like they were for me. And boy, how sad can that get? I just wish this happened some other time, but not in my lifetime. Mm, I should have, would rather be dead before this time, yep.
So do we really care enough? That's the fundamental question. You can see extended interviews with the Environment Minister, Greg Hunt, and a former director of the Marine Park Authority, John Day, on our website. Next on Four Corners, the highly paid surgeon with a sex and cocaine addiction who was rejected by the public hospital system but continued to operate in the private. That's the program for tonight. Until next Monday, good night.